good evening. Welcome to Artspace Mackay. Firstly, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight, the Yuiburra people. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend my acknowledgement to all Aboriginal members of the Biri Gubba Nation. This is such a thrill for us. Our um, relationship with the Queensland Art Gallery goes back a really long way. Mm. It's um, a really great partnership, and we're just so thrilled to be able to host and we are the very first cab off the rank as well, so um, we're really, really excited about hosting the touring show, Patricia Piccinini, Curious Affection on Tour. This is really exciting too, because it's a little bit of a, a preview, an exhibition preview for our, our wonderful volunteers and welcome especially to those new volunteers who've come on board. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to have you um, join our family. Um, and also for our educators to give them a little bit of insight into the exhibition. And of course, because we find ourselves in this very strange time of COVID, it's also another opportunity for us to um, be able to gather in a slightly smaller group and, and have a conversation about the exhibition. So thank you so much for taking time out to come and be with us tonight. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you Henry van Nordenberg, who is the Project Officer of Regional Services from the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Henry, I know, is incredibly passionate about the regions, and we're so grateful for that, Henry, because, as you can see, it results in some really exciting opportunities for regional galleries in Queensland. And we're thrilled to have Elizabeth Thompson, who is a sculpture conservator, with us um, this evening as well. So both Henry and Elizabeth and our exhibitions team have been really hard at work. They've had a huge day today, especially. So I'm really grateful that we're able to come together and have a chat tonight. So really tonight is just about um, giving you some insight into the exhibition, into Patric Patricia's practice, but also because we have Elizabeth here, it's a really great opportunity for us to talk to a conservator and, and to get that, um, that side, which is about caring for collections and um, a really great insight, Elizabeth. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Uh, without further ado, at the end there'll be plenty of time for questions. We will have a little bit of a chat about um, what the expectations are for our invigilators. So we'll have a chat about that tonight as well. Plenty of time for questions. Um, so have a think about it as you're listening to Henry and Elizabeth have a chat and then put your hand up and I'll come and find you and we can ask lots of questions at the end. Um, thank you once again for being such great supporters of our regional gallery. It means a lot. And I'm now going to hand over to Henry to give us some background to this touring show and also to Patricia's work. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Tracy. Um, thanks, Tracy, and the team here uh, today. It's been uh, and yesterday. It's been absolutely amazing. Uh, working with a very professional team installing the exhibitions here. Um, it's been uh, two quite full on days. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, uh, because it's the first cap of the rank, which also means that uh, we have to get used to installing the uh, exhibition uh, and using the plinths in the correct way. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, also, when, I, um, when we installed a, a plinth that wasn't the right way around, um, so we then had to demount it again, take the, well, take the artwork off it first. And, uh, and uh, funny enough, uh, we still did it, didn't quite do it the way it's supposed to, but it actually works. We have an argument on the reason why it is the way it is um, at the moment. Uh, but it's been really amazing uh, working with you uh, again. Um, as Tracy was saying, we indeed have a very long relationship with the gallery here. Uh, it's at least 80 years uh, that we, uh, the very first time that we brought an exhibition to the gallery here. So the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, have been exhibiting exhibitions around Queensland since 1900, the year 1900. So that's 120 years. Um, mm. So it's been, uh, it's been a program that we do is not new. 
Um, in, in those days, though, uh, people didn't worry too much about conservation of the artworks. Uh, they actually went to a lot of different places, um, and it was probably about 20 years ago when a lot of that changed. Um, so now a, a gallery needs to have climate and lighting control um, and you know we, because we need to look after the artworks we need to make sure that in a hundred years time uh, we still have the artworks in the collection so um, Elizabeth will uh, talk more about it uh, later on um, it's the first time also for me uh, I've, I've been working in this position for four and a half years but it's the first time that um, I had a person from conservation traveling with me and, uh, and uh, working together on in installing a show like this or any show um, and it's been it's been really amazing having that uh, because um, yeah, I can concentrate on other things um, and, um, and I didn't have to do the condition report um, and a lot of other things and it's been really, really amazing. Um, but not only that, um, Elizabeth is one of the people in, uh, in the gallery that is a yes and person, is concerned about conservation but is willing to talk about the ideas and how we can best do it and if it doesn't work then also happy to say Henry we can't do that and that's fine as well it's it's important to have the dialogue and um, so to give you a bit of a, a um, so I, I kind of see myself in the position as the conductor um, I uh, get a idea passed on to me or I come up with an idea of a touring exhibition uh, which often that idea often is based on having conversations with uh, with directors in regional galleries to see what they think they uh, would like or what they need. Of course, uh, I'm talking with every single gallery in Queensland, so it's, uh, it's trying to then find a balance between, between all of them, and we then select an exhibition. In this case, um, we wanted to create uh, an exhibition that was kind of a blockbuster type of show. Now, you may remember the last blockbuster that we toured around Queensland, which was uh, Ron Muick, Lady in the Bed, which also came to the gallery here. Um, it's one of those works where, you, you, where you, you see an image and you think, yeah, and then you walk into the gallery space and you think, whoa, I wasn't expecting that size. Um, and this work is, is hopefully is going to do the same kind of thing. When you see the images, you may think, oh, it's a photograph. You then find out it's a sculpture work um, and then see the size of it. And you think, wow, that's, that's really something else. And I think especially the room that we are sitting in here, um, you are still seeing it in a work in progress. Tomorrow, uh, the didactics will be on the wall, the labels will only be on the wall, but most importantly, the lighting will change. So this space is going to be quite dark. The mood is really going to be nearly like nighttime, moonlight type of space, as far as we can, because the room on the other side is going to be quite bright. So there is, is going to be light leaking uh, this way, of course, but it's kind of playing, playing with that. So this show, um, Patricia Piccinini had a, her biggest show uh, in her own career at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, uh, in 2018. She made quite a few works, particularly for that show, um, that were there, then exhibited there the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, the exhibition space itself uh, consisted of two different areas. The first area was a exhibition space where you had work shown uh, as you normally would in a gallery, a white plinth, a work on the plinth or the work on the wall, white walls, uh, enough space. And the other, world, the other part of the exhibition was the world. So you as, a, as an audience member stepped into this world that P Patricia Piccini created. She'd been wanting to create a world of its own for a long, long time. And it was the very first time at Kurgoma that she was able to do that. Now, to give you a bit of an idea, the size of the exhibition, um, the exhibition would, in, in terms of floor space, it'd probably be about 20 times this room. So filled by one artist. So imagine, imagine that. Now, saying that, Patricia Piccinini doesn't work by herself. She has a team of people working for her. Between, it fluctuates between five to 10 people, depending on how much work is happening in, in her studio space. So Patricia um, makes drawings, sketches of, uh, of creatures that she wants to create or flowers or whatever it is. She then passes those, those drawings onto her husband, 
Peter Hennessy, who's also an artist, and he kind of oversees the overall uh, project um, and discuss like, okay, how is this going to work? So they have this first conversation. They then give these, draw these drawing sketches to, a, um, to a, an artist who makes 3D drawings, or uh, sorry, computer drawings, um, and then they give that to a person who makes the molds, they make the molds and they do tests or they make small, uh, they actually do 3D, sorry, they, first of all, they do 3D printouts of the uh, sculpture works that, uh, that she creates and they look at it and again, they discuss how it could be worked better. Uh, so they change it, they do it again, uh, then they create a mold, um, then they talk to the person about the skin. So there's a person who her, the, for the last five, six years, she's only worked on skin. So she's really perfected the skin to look like skin. And then when you see the skin here, or if you see the skin of the teenage metamorphosis, it looks real. Um, now it's not real and you can't touch it, but if you were to touch it, then you would feel it's, it's quite, quite a hard surface. Um, but so she uses silicon and silicon has that beautiful part that it's quite transparent. The top layer is transparent. So you can create those different layers. So you could create the, or at some parts you can see that there's lines as if it's a vein that is coming through or, or um, spots on the, on the skin, uh, blemishes that you uh, might find just under the surface of the skin. And you'll find it on the sculpture works as well. So this lady has been working on that for a long, long time. And there's also a lady and her job, they call her the harvester. Any idea what that would be? Yeah. Hair. And where do you think she harvests the hair from? Real people. Real people, absolutely. So Patricia has a group of, uh, of friends or, uh, or maybe not so much friends anymore, <laughs> uh, some of them. I would say they would still be friends. Uh, and they come in every now and then and yeah, they get their hair cut. And that's the hair from all different parts of the body because humans have different hair on and especially we see the creature here uh, the hair on the arm of the man is very different than the hair on his head of course um, so it's quite an interesting so that's that's all she does she she has these sculptural works and she has to hair by hair puts them into the sculptural works it's quite a a, a, a intense job but all the way through that process patricia keeps looking at it and saying and, and, and giving uh, her, her comments or, um, or approval, stamp of approval on it. Now, as a invigilator, you might find that some people say, oh yeah, but she doesn't make, make these herself. She's part of the whole entire process. And the other thing you can say, you can, you can say that she is very much in charge of it. The other part is that if you are a director of a gallery, you don't do all the work. If you are a director of a big company, you don't do all the work. But, so it's a team that works, but the director of the company is the one that carries the name forward. And so is it, is it with Patricia. The other part of it is that if you look at the history of art, um, most artists um, have worked uh, in that way. So Rembrandt didn't uh, do the, the, the layers, the foundation of paint, someone else did that. So, and throughout history of, of uh, art, especially uh, when art uh, became more of a commercial entity, which started in the Netherlands in 1600s, um, because you know, they were the one that, that bought more artworks in the beginning uh, than, than anyone else. Uh, also, maybe we could say that they were um, possibly um, the, more known as the people that wanted to show off. That's probably why in the Netherlands people have big windows so they can show off everything that's inside. I'm Dutch so I can make jokes and fun about the Dutch too. They're crazy. Um, but um, so that's, that's kind of a, a part. So it's that, that idea of a artist not doing all the work and having a team of working for them is something that is, yeah, it's normal. It's, it, it just happens all the time. Uh, a lot of our, a lot of artists uh, that uh, that are here too are probably quite envious of that. Like imagine if uh, you don't have to do the dirty work on some of the works, or the works that you just don't like anymore. It's like, uh, uh, imagine if you have someone else doing that, and you can actually really do the, the stuff that's that's the, the integral part of your art practice that that really carries your um, your signature. So as the as a uh, so. Um, Yes, the idea was born to have this show touring um, around, around Queensland. Now, uh, did anyone actually go to Brisbane and see the show in Brisbane by any chance? Yep, a few, 
few people. Um, so the, the difference between that show and this show is, apart from the, the size, um, is that um, in, in my job, I only tour works from the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art Collection. We don't tour other work. Uh, sometimes that might, they might go to other places, um, but it's not something that, that we do. So we tour artworks uh, that are owned by the, well, the state of Queensland, and it's also part of our job that we have to do uh, because you, as a taxpayer, you own part of the work. So you need to be able to see the work. So that's part of, uh, part of the job. So um, yeah, we tour works that are in our collection of all Vitrini's works. There's only one work that we don't tour. And the reason for that is that uh, to pull this work apart and set it up every single time would actually damage the artwork in the long run. So that's the only reason uh, that we uh, don't tour that work. And that's called the Observer. Uh, for those that have seen it, it's a stack of chairs on top of each other. Uh, how, how tall is it? About two and a half meters? Yeah, about that. Um, and on top of that is this, uh, this boy kind of on the tipping point. And when you look at the boy, the boy is very human-like. Um, but it's on the tipping point, and that's why he's sitting on the top. So it's actually making a comment about when does uh, a human become a, um, I know, I forgot the word. Um, what are the creatures called? Chimera. Ah. When does a human become a chimera, or when does a chimera become a human? And that's kind of like what she's uh, kind of playing around with, with that work. So that's the only work um, that, uh, that is not touring. If you want to see the work, you have to come to a gallery. Yeah. And I'm afraid I said no to that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still, we're still in contact with each other. So it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's important to, to understand uh, the reason why that can't tour. And then you say, well, okay, well, that's, that's the way it is. And the other thing with a two is that it's two and a half meters. Now here, that's fine. The next uh, venue that it's going to is uh, Northside, former Kick Arts. And for those people that have been in that space, the ceiling is much lower. So that would uh, cause a problem as well. Now, the other part, which I find a really fun uh, part of my job, is that um, as soon as we talked about Piccinini touring, um, for those who have seen it, can you remember where the couple was in? A very large caravan. So the caravan, at least as big for us from here to the wall. Now, can we tour a caravan? Well, some people say, oh, you can just put it on a trailer. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's kind of a funny thing because um, as soon as, so all these items that are here, this tent, so I actually went shopping for this tent um, and it was pristine. I gave it to Patricia and look what she did to it. Um, but as soon as we bring this tent into, as soon as we hand it over to the conservators and the registration, um, we are not allowed to touch it anymore unless we wear gloves because then it becomes an artwork. Yep. All the items that are in here are now part of the art. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much you all know about the role of the conservator, so I just thought I'd go to uh, first principles about that. Does, do, you, do you all know? Or? No. So at um, Craig Gomer we have uh, paintings, paper and sculpture conservators. So, and that it's our role to take care of the state collection for future generations. So it's not just an immediate thing, it's a, we always have to keep that in mind. And we're guided by a set of ethics and also by uh, 10 agents of deterioration. That's what we've decided uh, will cover you know, any issues. And there, um, let me see if I can remember them all. Uh, fire, water, pests, pollutants, uh, physical damage, theft, light, uh, temperature, humidity, and dissociation. So it, everything we do, we have to keep those 10 agents in mind you know, all the time. Uh, so for this show, when Henry uh, gave me his wish list, <laughs> I had to do that strike through for that, that, the boy, um, you know, because of what Henry said, that it's... Um, needs really careful handling and taking it apart and together all the time is going to cause physical damage. For some of the other works in this show, um, we, we talk, when, when, when we get the list, we talk through what is going to be required for the works. And the lighting is definitely going to be a lot lower in this room 
because these two works have uh, materials in them that will be uh, affected by higher light levels. So it's, you know, it's going to be a, you know, a quite, quite a bit lower. Um, so when, when we get the list, we go through to do an assessment of can this travel safely? Uh, does it need uh, a specialist, uh, special care um, when it's being installed, etc.? Um, is there an installation manual telling people how to install the work? Um, does it need treatment before it goes? Does it need cleaning, uh, repairs? Uh, is it likely to suffer damage um, while it's travelling? Is there a crate for it already? You know, there's, you know, it's a whole list of questions that we, we need to go through and answer. Um, so for these works to prepare them, it's, uh, we do a full condition report. So for this work, as Henry was saying, um, it was just going to be the couple and then the tent was new, so we were going great, don't have to do too much with that. And then um, it was sent down to Patricia and she's now recreated it and it came back with all of the paraphernalia. So we then um, have to accession, all the registrars have to accession every single piece. Um, and because we have such a, a broad range of care, we have to work with all the different departments. Um, so, and we work quite closely as conservators with the registrars. So, and everything in there, in that um, tent is now labelled and numbered and um, has a condition report for each piece. Um, and in that condition report, we're looking for uh, what damage has occurred already uh, and giving warning signs of what may happen, what we can do to prevent future damage. Um, like for example, the, the esky is really quite filthy in there if you have a good look at it, but that's how Patricia gave it to us and, it, so, and it's a used thing. So it should stay that way. We shouldn't get out the scrubbing brush and you know, make it all clean again. Not that we use scrubbing brushes, except, <laughs> except on bronzers. We do use them on bronzers. Um, uh, and the, the sheet, for example, uh, was new when uh, we put this together. She said she wanted a sheet, so we went and bought one. Um, and we you know, washed it, didn't iron it or anything, but um, uh, when we first draped it over, uh, we showed Patricia, Henry, you, I think you sent her mm. the image and she came back with, the sheet looks too new. So we actually had to, um, usually we steam out creases, but this time we, screen, we steamed creases into it and you know, scrunched it all up. So, um, and there were very strict, they were quite strict, mm. precise instructions on how to install this piece. Uh, she, they sent back uh, detailed photographs with um, where everything had to be placed and, and why. For example, the, the men's jeans there, um, she stated that she wanted it to look like they'd just been stepped straight out of. But um, of course, when we pack that, we're not packing it in that, we're carefully folding it and make, or making sure there are as few folds as possible. Um, everything in there is so beautifully um, crated uh, that like the esky has its own foam cavity in the crate you know that's par silk lined and so, so there's no abrasion to it and you know, it, it's almost farcical but it's not when you then consider that it has to stay as is for hundreds of years so um, i trying to think what else I think even like yeah. the, the um, there's a drink bottle and the, the little uh, uh, spout, spout. Uh, is out. And so those are the things as well to think of. Yeah. Um, there's behind the bed, there's a hessian bag that is leaning against it to kind of keep the back off uh, the, the couple as well. Mm. But at the same time, um, when you're standing there, you can probably just see the hessian bag underneath the bed. Uh, so uh, there are these little details. It's not only at the front, it's also at the back. Yeah. There's actually a jumper on the floor at the back that you might gl um, glimpse because I've told you it's there more than anything. I don't think you'd really see it otherwise, yeah. but you know, that was important for it for yeah. to be there. And she wants people to peer in the windows and um, to have a look at everything. Yeah. 
The, yeah. um, so when the, Patricia, when we sent the tent, uh, there is actually a, um, a, uh, a yeah, what do you call it? A, um, uh, awning. An awning uh, connected to it. So um, and poles. So um, yeah, in my mind, um, the awning was going to be on it, and it were, they are needed to create a um, a way to to make sure the awning would stay up. Um, and of course, you go into gallery, so you can't put pegs in the ground. Um, so this plinth here and the one at the front, they were actually going to have a hole in it where the, the poles were going to sit through. So that would have been about this point. Um, but then it came back and she didn't want that. She wanted it to sit like this. Um, but she, so she set up the tent in her studio. She placed some items in the tent. Um, and then she let it be there for a while. Um, mm. And I think it was in her studio for a good month. And she kept changing things or adding things to it before she then sent it to us with the, with the result the way it is now. So she really has spent a lot, a lot of time with it to ensure that, the, um, that everything, uh, everything works really well. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then send us, as uh, Elizabeth was saying, send us quite detailed Photogra photographs of the placement of uh, of all of the items, which we then oh sorry terrible noise which we then expanded on. So our installation manual is um, even more detailed because we're we need to talk about the handle the safe handling of everything too, um, you know, and the the fact that the light needs to go off at night time. Just you know details like that. Um, and, and in preparation for this, the couple is um, quite hollow inside uh, and the legs are um, silicon, nearly solid silicon actually, which is not the case for all of hers, for her works. So they need to be supported. And I was very um, apprehensive about handling this work on tour. So we came up with this solution that it doesn't have to be handled and that it's actually uh, to, uh, in the crate on a board um, covered in that rug uh, and then the, the figure is the figures are placed on top of the rug but there's a hole cut in the rug and there's a, a form that takes up the cavity of the figure so then they can't move around um, and all you do is just pick up the board and place it uh, so that, that ended up being a good solution. The pillow, for example, is sewn in place because it travels, they travel you know, in comfort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that, that's um, also the case, but with a completely different work to the heaven bound work, the white embryo-like work that's um, on the other side of the wall here. Um, I was quite apprehensive about handling that as well because it's so bulbous that you kind of have to hug it. Two people have to hug it almost to, to move it. And there's just too high risk of, of um, it being damaged because it's such a high gloss surface. So our wonderful um, workshop have come up with this um, solution where you, you don't have to handle it at all and you just click in either side of the plinth underneath the work. So it's quite complex, but, but in the end, simple you know, to get mm. together. Mm. Um, to get the plinth together. Yep, it yeah, so good. it's a, an amazing solution. Yeah, easiest yeah. install that's ever. Oh, in, yeah. Yep. Yeah, wonderful. And that idea we will definitely be using in future shows. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's because it's so bulky and if you would handle it with the gloves, it also becomes slippery. So you've got to think of, of that aspect as well mm. uh, of works like that. And um, yeah. 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 Yeah, amazing, amazing uh, workshop team. The, the, the way they think and they, they mm. they're very much problem solving. Mm. Um, sometimes they just uh, they, they I come up with something or I, I ask them a question and they just look at me like. <laughs> but, uh, but, they're, but they're very patient. They're very, they're they're as extremely well, patient. Yeah. They're extremely patient, and they have yeah. a great sense of humour as well. Yeah. Um, as uh, yeah, as you need, and uh, I think it's important to have a good sense yeah, of humour. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. So. I just like to uh, maybe because well, I think it's it's great to to talk more about the technical aspect of it or, or mm. to um, uh, I like to talk a bit about things and like like this uh, the things that you don't see the things that you may mm. not read about 
so especially if you are a, uh, a invigilator in the space or if you are an educator, uh, to be able to tell the, 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 the audience like, well, did you know this or did you know this part, which is an important part. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, with, uh, with Piccinini, I mean, Pat Patricia Piccinini is uh, one of our best known artists uh, alive in, in, in Australia. Uh, the majority of her shows are overseas, they're not uh, in Australia. She's, mm -hmm. she's got a, a very good name uh, overseas in, in Europe, America, uh, Asia. Um, and that's, that's where most of her shows go to. Um, she is a, uh, an extremely passionate person, a extremely calm person. Mm -hmm. When you talk, uh, most of our minds um, uh, or, or speech would go about four times as fast as her. Uh, she, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate the, mm -hmm. the, the patience and the slow pace that she has in terms of her, uh, the, way, the way she goes about things. Um, and I think it's, it's uh, necessary too if you have uh, if you're uh, such a big name artist and you have so many things happening at the same time. Um, we had a, a bit of a conversation with her uh, this afternoon uh, so to show her the space. Unfortunately, she can't be here. She, is, uh, she lives in Melbourne. Needless to say why she can't meet, uh, be here. Um, she is, uh, she, yeah, she said that she can't, can't be here for it, but she will, uh, will in the, hopefully in the future. Uh, come up to uh, to Mackay. So um, Patricia is is um, actually I'm just going to read this out because uh, it's much better written than the, otherwise it's the way it comes out of my mouth. So it's probably best to uh, to read this part uh, part for you. Um, so Patricia uh, Patricia's creatures are a fusion between multiple species, multiple beings. They come from the Asian word of the mythical creature called Chimeras. For those who don't know what chimeras are, chimeras were, chimeras were creatures uh, that you would find uh, the, in, in mythology from Egypt, Greece, but also in the Hindu cultures, uh, which you find the, the idea, the, the stories of chimeras. So most of the time chimeras were kind of uh, shown visual, visually as uh, creatures that had a lion's head, uh, a goat's body, a serpent's tail, and they were of course also fire-breathing. Um, as we all know, those creatures to be. Um, so um, it was once a mystical beast, but now it's kind of more of this, uh, this scientific reality. Mythology has a large presence in, the, in a lot of cultures. Um, they are uh, the way we get the meaning and why the world is the way it is. It's a description and that reflects our existence, our current world and our belief system. So myths, just want to pointed out, we often think of I have a myth, of a story that is not true. Now, um, if you talk to a lot of indigenous cultures and we call something a myth, and with that in mind, they say, but that story is true. That is the way the landscape was shaped. So just be really careful when you think of that or when you say that, and be mindful that a myth is, is something that has, has shaped uh, our way of thinking. And for a lot of people, that is the truth. Um, and who is to say that it's not the truth? You know, who's to say? Um, I think it's an important, a very important thing to, to respect and, uh, and uh, embrace. And I think it's, a, I mean, myths, are, I think they're magical and beautiful and there should be more of them. Um, so um, a myth, uh, the world, uh, that explanation, it's, a, uh, it's also a, um, a, a legi it legitimizes uh, why society is ordered the way it is. It follows a logical binary, uh, which is good versus evil. Hero, villain, beauty, ugly, smart, dumb, someone you know versus the outsider. More often, the story, it's, a, it's not in the storytelling that we tend to solve it, solve the tension in the, of the narrative by flavoring the side of the most sympathetic party with the good. We reject the bad and we even go as far as tolerate the defeat of the other. Patricia Piccinini's work further tests our way of thinking about nature and nurture, the real and the unreal, what it is and what it means to be human. She explores the way we interact with each other, with our families, friends and strangers in the natural world and technology. Rather than focusing on the differences between humans and creatures, 
Patricia focuses on the loving gestures, the characteristics and the emotions we share. She just reminds us the closeness that we have with people around us is not just a human experience. Animals have a meaningful relationship with each other and with us. Now, for anyone who has animals, you probably totally agree with that. Okay, it's such an important spot. But it's not only with animals. I mean, when can you remember the last time you held, you held a teddy bear in your hand or, a, or you see someone holding a, something that is dear to them? Or if you see someone that has a, a item that they treasure, um, that they are so proud of and that they would do anything for to protect it. Well, Patricia, Patricia Piccinini taps into that. Mm -hmm. If we see the very first work, or have the, very early, the earliest work in the shell is a very large photograph behind the wall called Psychotourism. Did anyone recognize the figure, the, the, uh, the person in the photograph by any chance? Sophie Lee, the actress. Uh, I can't remember Sophie Lee. I lived overseas when she was on TV. Uh, so, you know, it's just another character for me, but it's Sophie Lee. She's holding a, uh, a lump. Lump, uh, it's a, um, um, so it's a creature that, uh, that was created um, as a, like, it's like a, a baby, but it's like a baby, like a handbag. And you can give that handbag as much love as you want and it will, won't change. So the way you want to give it love tonight, today and share, and, and share your emotions with can be the same as tomorrow because it won't change. But she's holding it in her hands as if like, don't you come any closer. And if you are coming any closer, if you're going to hurt it, we'll jump. Uh, and that's, so that's the work there. So the background of the, um, of the landscape that you see is completely Completely uh, computer generated. It kind of reminds me of the Kimberley's uh, landscape. Mm. So um, it also brings me back to the very first time. So the Drome Studio is the name of the studio that Patricia and her husband created. Uh, started off with a studio that created backdrops for uh, for companies and mainly companies that were dealing with art. So companies that couldn't afford their uh, or couldn't afford or didn't know how to create these digital backgrounds so they would create these digital backgrounds so that was their kind of the start of the drum studio and then from there it just went to this beautiful crazy world that she's creating now so it's quite an important part but that's um, so I kind of like look at that work and I think well how is that different to that person that creates that uh, that collects stamps and I mean trying to uh, then go through their book. They'll tell you tell you to slow down with the page, turning of the pages because the stamps may fall out. Uh, or if you have a person that has a collection of antique cu cups, uh, they'll probably tell you to do the same. But be careful. And so it's, it's that precious aspect of it that is so important for work. Now, if we look at the um, the heaven bound work, so it's the on the other side. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, what was the nickname that you have for it? Embryo. Embryo. Um, <laughs> I call the car nugget. Um, so there's all these different names for it. Um, if you think of a car, your favourite car, and if you think of all the parts of that car that you really really like, and you get rid of everything else that is not important for you, and create an artwork of that. That's what Patricia has done. So she loves lines, texture, material, um, sp uh, space, uh, reflection. So she like, uh, grabbed all of that together and she created this embryo car nugget. Um, I also think it looks like a frog <laughs> from one side. So she's created this, this, this item that is kind of like everything for her. And it's completely useless apart from it's aesthetic. It's aesthetic beauty. And that's what that work is very much about. So, and then after that, you can think, then she thought, well, what if all the items that we have around us actually have a life on their own? Mm -hmm. What if you open the drawer of cutlery and all of a sudden your forks start to walk out? Um, what would that be like? But he has done us with, the, uh, with the, um, the, the, the stacks, the scooters. Now the scooters itself, um, for those who know the, the mods, the mods scooters in England uh, that had lots of mirrors and, and lights on it. 
So she created that idea kind of from that, but then she turned them into the antlers of a deer, of a stag. So that's kind of where that comes from. And if you look at the stag, then in one way, you kind of wonder, um, is it a loving relationship? Is it a, um, is it a, a overpowering relationship? Um, is it, you, what is going on? Is it, a, is it a mother and child relationship? What is going on? You don't quite know. And as you're walking around, then there's, you see characteristics of the scooter that kind of um, reminds you of the way we pull faces or the way we, we may say certain, certain things. Or, uh, so I think it's, a, it's a, quite a beautiful part. The other way you can also look at it and think, well, is it the part of the, of the predator and the prey? Is that what's happening? And if we look at that, we look at the, the um, uh, 17th century paintings of a lion attacking a horse and the horse is on the ground and the lion is kind of overpowering. Uh, so there's, again, there's also those artistic uh, histor historical references within her works mm. as well. Uh, this work is, I find, really quite fascinating because we look at it and it's that gaze. It's like we are, we are looking into a space that we're not supposed to look into because it's such a quiet, private embrace that's happening there. Uh, and it's also very much a role reversal. It's the, the guy is completely relaxed, he's asleep. She is the one that it is, it keeps her eyes open. And, um, it, and it, it's definitely done from that feministic uh, point of view. Uh, Patricia is very much aware of what's happening in the world and, and where it's going. And she's very much aware that she is one of the very first female artists in Australia that really made a name for herself. And she's really wanted to say, hey, we need more of this. We, we need to make sure that we represent women in a correct way and in, in a way that is not the way it was in the past. Like there's, there's much more to us than is portrayed in the past. So that's, it's a very important part in, in the work as well. Is there anything that you like to add to anything I've said? Well, I was actually wondering if anyone had any questions really about the process. Oh, so Sorry, Tracy. Oh, um, so how folks can Yeah, um, they can peer but not touch. Yeah, so um, that's with everything, um, no touching at all. The oils on our hands actually start degrading the surface of most materials, so it's best just to say no touching at all. Yeah. Okay. And no sitting on the plinths. And when, with, especially with this one too, it's the, it's the touching, it's like, just pretend that there's a, a sheet of glass in front of here. So mm. don't reach in, yeah. don't step in, all those, all those things. And at the same time, if you are an invigilator, um, I've done, I did your job uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the Queensland Art Gallery for about six years. So I know how stressful it can be. Nice. Um, it's, a, it's one of those things, um, and, uh, uh, Elizabeth may not like what I'm saying, but don't st stress about it because no. stuff happens. Um, and um, while we don't want it to happen, um, especially if you are a volunteer, uh, we are extremely lucky that you are here to do that job. Uh, and your time is extremely valuable. Um, and without your time uh, that you're giving to the gallery, most galleries in Australia would not be able to operate without you. So that is a very th important thing to remember. And um, sometimes, and also I think, you know, if, if a person touches an artwork, which they shouldn't, but at least they're interested when they're doing it. So keep, definitely keep that in mind because it's a very important part to, um, yeah, there is something that, and I mean, these flowers, they look tactile. They, they, they scream to be touched, but you can't. <laughs> Except everyone today, we did because we were wearing gloves. With, with gloves on, yeah. <laughs> so if you want to touch, become a volunteer to help with the install team. <laughs> um, so actually, if, even with these flowers, um, so at the Queensland Art Gallery, when we had the show, there were 2,000 of these flowers uh, created this beautiful, beautiful scene. I think it was 3,000. 3,000. Yeah. 3,000 yeah. flowers. 
Um, and what our workshop team did as, as she walked in, they created a floor that kind of went a little bit like that. It was a sprung floor. It was a sprung floor. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you stepped somewhere, it caused those flowers yeah. to start swaying. So it was just magic. It was magic. Yeah, it now, was. I did talk to our workshop team to see if we could have that happen <laughs> here too. And they laughed. Yeah. <laughs> There's trip hazards and a whole heap of other things that, uh, that's, uh, but I tried, I tried. I do apologize. For the invigilators who are here, the tops actually come off. Um, they're, they're actually, and they're top heavy. Yeah, they do just come off. So um, please just be aware of that. I, I doubt if anyone's going to do that, but um, I think it's better that you know. Mm. Yeah, and the, the, the flowers, um, I mean, the, the show at, at Quagoma, um, was, it was a very much a, a show about the idea of reproduction, um, the idea of, uh, of the next generation and, and what's, what may happen. So these flowers, you, you may see organs, you may think, oh, that looks like a heart, you may think, mm. oh, that looks like the, the head of a duck. Uh, so there's quite a few things that, that you may see in the flowers. There's four, di four different types? Three. Yeah, three different types of, of flowers. Um, and they, they do turn, so we turn them all uh, to uh, ensure that yeah. they were pointing different directions and, and nothing was, looks the same. Yeah, and that was a stipulation that um, Patricia asked for, that everything was very random. Um, that yep. the, so there wasn't... do an install, it would be different again. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see that there's these plinths that come apart. So this is one plinth, that's another one, and that's another one. So the configuration mm -hmm. will be different in each space depending on that size. Well the size. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. each single thing, like each stem, each head is numbered. So one of 200, two of 200, etc. And uh, in the crate, it's got the, each one has its own little nesting spot. So um, they're very, very well cared for. Um, yeah, demounting this is going to be interesting. Like, who's got number three? You know, where's the spot? Right. Yeah. 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 So what are the flowers made of? They're made of, um, is there a plastic called ABS? Acrylonitrile butadiene styrene plastic, um, which is the same plastic that Le Lego is made from. But this one has a more matte surface compared to the shiny surface of um, the Lego. And yeah. these ones are not stackable. No. <laughs> they do click together. Yes, they do click together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, which is a relatively um, uh, stable plastic. So it, it'll last 100 years. Uh, we haven't done aging. We, we do uh, aging tests to, to see how long materials last. And 100 years is um, pretty good for this plastic. We, I, I would actually like to ask her for the moulds of these because if we had the moulds, then we could actually recast them in 100 years um, when they do start deteriorating. So I've just got to ask our curator if he can approach her about that. Um, some artists are very happy for that, um, others not so. Mm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm. Yeah. She, Yep. Yeah, she, and I think she would be quite um, happy about that because it was her, we had a touching station yep. Yep. because when, at Craig Omer, when um, the original show was, was being talked about, I, I was very, I want to touch that, um, you know, how soft is that hair, how real is that, what does the skin feel like? And I didn't want anyone else to touch that though. So um, they, they actually made a, a touching station, uh, which were beautiful little hairy, um, like baby. Uh, uh, possums. But possums, yeah. It was, yeah, it was, yeah possum, mouse. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, yeah koala. Little, little baby creatures they were, and they were yeah. so beautifully so soft. So cute. Yeah, so, and yeah. the GSOs on the floor actually walked around with them and let people touch them. and. So you could, and you could see the process to a certain extent. Oh, and the other part about that touching station is that there were three of them uh, and, the, and they gradually got more bald because they had done this previously and the one that was quite bald had been touched a lot. So they, people could see that uh, the hair does come out and that you're wrecking um, the, the works, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite amazing having those there. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I was, um, 
I had a school group come into the gallery from, uh, from a regional place and um, I knew that they were going to come so I took one of them out and I walked around the gallery with this, this thing. It's like so cute. Yeah, That's great. yeah they were. The, they, yeah. the detail of, yeah. of these things, it's just, it's just incredible. Yeah. It's really They're quite, beautiful. the way it's made is just amazing. Yeah, um, have a look at the feet and the hands in there. They're just, they're really exquisite. And the feet are, um, well, the hands are Patricia's hands and the feet are her husband Peter's. All right. Oh, yeah. There you yeah. Go. yeah. Except yeah. the toenails so, are not oh, quite. Oh, yeah, well, you'll, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I wonder yeah. if they real. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a very important part. Um, I actually, re remind me, um, if Patricia does come here, um, that I ask her if, to see if she can bring one of those creatures with her, because that would be really nice yeah. to... Uh, if you do get a question from people uh, asking what uh, the, the artworks are made of, uh, the, the labels on the wall have all the information on it, mm -hmm. and also the room brochure that you've got there, uh, has the information on as well. And be generous with giving those room brochures out. There's plenty of them. And if we need to reprint, we will, but you've got 1,400 of them here. At least 1,400, no, 1,400, 40, It's a high number. Um, and so it's fine to, fine to give them out. Um, also, um, I do believe that the educators here, they already know that um, there are education resources available, primary and secondary, um, that are also on the website. Um, so they are a program to give to students prior to coming to the gallery, during the uh, ex a visit to the gallery and after. So it really is a, it's a quite uh, involved uh, work that, uh, that's uh, and, and great for the students to, to have. I think it's on your website as well, and it's also on our website. So feel free to, to have a look at that, that as well. Um, mm. There was another thing I was going to say, and I just can't. It'll come to you. Thank Has anyone got any other questions? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. Um, I'm really interested in the representation of the couple in the tent. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about that work in the Nick Lennart Gallery um, collection, will the tent and this new presentation live on in your collection now? Yes. Um, so for this work, we currently have three iterations. Okay. Uh, so this is one iteration. The couple on their own is a possibility as well, because uh, we talked about this very thing yeah. with Patricia and Peter, um, and then the caravan, the couple in the caravan. Um, yeah. Caravans, Stored uh, off-site. Yeah. yeah, we're lucky enough that we have an off-site store. Yeah. But all the paraphernalia that goes in the caravan, which also has been numbered, um, is in a crate on site because there are some materials that aren't safe to go off site. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's um, a thing we have to do quite often with different works, um, document the different iterations. Uh, yeah, it's really important. Yep. Um, it was also interesting that, that with, with that, I mean, as soon as we started thinking of touring it, um, I, I have to admit, I, it was probably for about two weeks that I, I really, 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 really wanted the caravan to tour. Yeah, you suggested I the trailer, really I'm did. pretty sure. And I thought, I can get that extra truck, uh, because I thought, okay, that, that, so we needed to get a truck for that itself. So that would have meant we needed to get three trucks to get the exhibition here instead of, uh, instead of two. So my way of thinking of it was straight away, okay, well, how can we get it into the venue? So in my mind, I was ticking off all the venues that were big enough and had a loading dock that we could slide it in. And I was thinking of here, it's like, yep, this works. Um, and so I, was, I went all of the exhibition, all exhibition spaces was thinking, it's like, yep, yep, yep. Um, and, but then I realized, wait a moment, if you have, in our gallery, we have a, uh, we have a, um, a, a lift, lift, a lift, an, um, art lift. an art lift, but also a, uh, to get it into the truck. So we can bring that onto the same level as the truck and it's big enough to sit the caravan on to then move it, move it in. So it stays on the same uh, level, if you like, to get it in. But not all loading docks are the same height. So how can you then get a caravan that's the size of a truck? <laughs> it's like, that doesn't work. So, that was, so then I had to scrap that idea. 
Now, then by that stage, I had also gone online already and seen different iterations of Piccinini's uh, couple. So I've seen the couple in a hotel room. I've seen the couple on the couch uh, and in other beds uh, and by itself. So, mm -hmm. um, and this stage, I, I hadn't told anyone, uh, but I went online and I was looking for a tent. So I created a Word document with, um, with six different tents. They looked fantastic, all of them. Yeah. One of them, which was my second best one, um, but it didn't work because I'm, I'm sure um, um, Elizabeth would have said no to it. But it was this magic, uh, it was a blow up tent. It, was, it had this massive round dome, which was white, and then it had this other compartment, so like one of us, the shower, and then like a living area. So imagine this kind of like dome like tent that would sit here. But then I was thinking, yeah, but what if someone falls against it and has something sharp in their hands and pierces the tent? <laughs> and then this plastic goes onto the couple. So it's like, yeah, it's not going to work. It doesn't sound like it would be very stable plastic either. No. no. But <laughs> we don't want fantastic. that in our collection. It looks fantastic. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I kind of had the fun of, of doing that. Um, and then so we found this tent. Also, the good thing about this one is, is it takes 30 seconds to put it up. <laughs> Not quite, but uh, it, it's really, really fast and it's stable. You don't need to use pegs for it. Mm. Um, and uh, so we, uh, but I had only seen it online. So then I did find a supplier in Brisbane who had it and they also had it set up in the showroom, they told us. So I went with, um, with uh, Warren, the head of uh, the, the workshop to, uh, to the place. Um, and Elizabeth had instructed me that she needed to see someone lying in the tent. So I was posing <laughs> in the tent um, and we sent those photographs through. So uh, it's been a really beautiful process. Um, to give you an idea of how long it takes to organize this exhibition, um, it's been since the show was out, uh, up in, uh, in the Queensland Art Gallery. So it's been over two years mm. of, of mm. doing the, the, the whole part. In my job, I do everything so from the working on the idea to budgets to design to I don't do the design but I, I instigate all the process and mm. it's just been it's been yeah a it's, wonderful experience it's such a collaboration isn't mm, it absolutely. We, we had practice runs yes. installing several things because yeah. we didn't we thought we needed that and, yeah. and we did we did yeah. yes yeah. yeah yeah and this work um, because we hadn't shown this iteration at the gallery before needed to be photographed by our photographers so was um, a good practice for us to set it up and do the installation manual at the same time with all the steps. Yeah. Yeah. And the other good thing about this iteration uh, to the further on your question is that the caravan, we could never show the caravan in our Australian art section in Quagoma, in Quag, because there's stairs, mm. so you can't get it in there. In this mm. tent we can. And mm. uh, so, yeah, that's another reason why, uh, why we have this version as well. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. 10 agents of deterioration, yeah. So yeah. what is dissociation? Uh, when a work um, becomes separate from its cultural history, um, that's, that's probably the main one. Um, uh, trying to think what else, what's a good example? Um, a lot of the indigenous works um, are quite, there's no story with them anymore. There's no history of who owned the piece. Um, so Yeah, that, that's right. What is this object anymore? Because there is no um, story or history or per person behind it. Um, that, that's a, a very big one, really. Um, also, the making of something, the practice of, of making a work is integral to, to some pieces. And if that, that is lost, that information, um, then again, it, it's just a thing. It's not. Um, it, it doesn't have that uh, complexity. Yeah, that's very important. Mm. Also, your job is to keep uh, alive for future generations, but then mm. people, you're obviously you know, accumulating more art all the time. So, like, how, does, how yeah. do you end up having enough space to have all this art? We built another yeah, storage space. We built another storage space, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and at the time of acquisition, it's um, important to see if we can interview the artist. Yeah. 
what is their idea behind it, how did they make it, what are the materials they used. We don't always get that opportunity, unfortunately. Um, things just appear at the gallery sometimes, uh, or they're gifted. Um, but yeah, that. So we we have a set of artists um, interview questions that we try and get through um, with, as often as possible, um, so we can retain all of that knowledge. A lot of my job ends up being documentation for that reason. Um, yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I think the um, the historical part um, is is a uh, is, and that journey that an artwork goes through is very important. Mm. Um, and I'm actually just looking at these works here and just going back to art history. Um, these flowers, uh, the base of these flowers, so the very first part, this part here of the flowers, but that there, does it remind you of anything? Yeah, not not the last, something historical. Would I? Think back, <laughs> think back 28,000 years BC. Oh, the woman, the Earth Mother. Venus. Mm. So that's a reference to that. Mm. So it's also another really beautiful thing that to bring back There's to. There's so to many it. layers it's in her just, work. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. So the. Um, the other thing is these flowers, these 200 flowers, are very generously gifted uh, by Patricia to us, so cultural gifted. Um, cultural gifted is a program, all the flowers, yeah, uh, is a program. The that's 200. The, 200, yeah, 200, not, yeah, yeah not. And are they, are they out of the 3,000 or the, they're on top of? No, so we only out, have. Out the, of. Yeah, out of the 200. Yeah, so the rest yeah. of them went back after yeah. the big show. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, cultural gift program is a way where you, as an artist, you gift a work to a gallery. Um, so you have two uh, people uh, looking at the work, two valuers looking at the work and establishing the value, and then you get that, that money taken off your taxable income, uh, and you can spread it out over five years. And so you get that money back in a, in a different way. You don't get the cash, but it's taken out of your tax, so therefore you will get a higher tax return. Uh, which we all like. Um, so it's a really beautiful way of, of gifting your work that doesn't cost the regional gallery anything. It gets you as an artist, uh, your work into a collection or it extends the collection of, of, um, of your work in an art, ga art gallery. Um, and in this case, this, I think this work is integral to the TNH metamorphosis. It really adds a, a very important part to it and to this as well. Really, it, it's without the flowers, we couldn't reproduce the idea of the world that Patricia mm. is wanting to do. Mm. So that's why I think the flowers are really important. Mm. Um, but just to also then promote the idea of cultural gifting, if you are an artist and you have sh you're showing your work at a regional gallery, ask the gallery if they might be interested in, you, in, their, in your work in their collection. Because it's a great way to still have your work in there. Most of the time, galleries can't always afford to buy your work. And it's a really beautiful way to add your work to their collection or, uh, in any, any gallery and still get the money back. So, I mean, you don't get the, the full amount, but you get pretty about a, at least a third of that back. And that's, you know, that's often mm -hmm. more than the money that we spend on to an artwork. So it's a really beautiful way to assist the gallery for uh, acquiring works and also make sure that your art practice lives on uh, way beyond your time on this, this earth. Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd mention also uh, the reason for doing the condition reports. Mm. So I checked the works as they came out of their crates um, as we were installing them today, but I will also then be checking them when we come back for the demount to, to see that no damage has occurred. Like that's, that's what we're aiming for. Um, and that they're quite detailed, the condition reports, uh, you know, up to any minor abrasions, color transfers, um, cracks, you know, there's a myriad of damage, um, but because this show is going to so many places, um, I'll be looking even close, more closely as we go along, just the in and out of crates and the transport itself you know, can cause damage, so, mm. yeah. Yeah, and if, the, uh, if you are an invigilator, uh, you'll probably also find that uh, you may be given a, a list uh, to check the works. So. Um, the uh, most of the works, the works in that room, in a way, 
Um, it's, a, it's a weekly check to make sure that everything is, is right. Whereas teenage metamorphosis and the couple, it's a daily check to make yeah. sure that everything is still there, that things haven't moved. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it happens, but it's just also then for you a way to say, okay, sorry, this has moved. We need to change it. Um, and then someone will come out with their gloves and change it for you. So the gloves are, again, is an important part of, yeah. of that, that process. Yeah, for example, this uh, towel here underneath Teenage Metamorphosis, um, if you move that, you'll see that there's a layer of mylar underneath uh, as a barrier film between the work and the paint on the plinth. Um, quite heavy works and, and there's some weight to that sculpture. Um, because of the pressure to the paint, can they, they can actually stick in place and then you get the paint transfer when you try and lift the work off. So uh, that mylar is that, is that barrier. So, but in this case, we'll also mark where the towel should be. So if someone does move the towel out of place, you'll be able to place it back with wearing gloves um, in the correct position. Yeah. Any other questions or any comments? <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Henry and Elizabeth. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, please join me in thanking Henry and Elizabeth for their time tonight. Thank you. You might like to spend a little, uh, a few more moments taking in the exhibition before heading off. Billy Joe, are there any places, do you know how the Saturday morning talk is going? Do we have places? So um, if, you, if you're talking to friends and family and you're um, saying how fantastic it was tonight, please encourage them to get on to the Eventbrite website and book a place at the public talk that's taking place this Saturday from 10.30 a.m. We are also staying open extra late this Saturday, so the gallery will usually closes at 3 o'clock on Saturday, because it's our opening weekend, we'll be open from 10 a.m. right through to 6.30 p.m. Oh. on Saturday night, because we also have some events taking place at our entertainment centre as well. So a great opportunity to come back in and, and take in the work. Thank you so much for your time, especially our amazing volunteers. We love you. You're wonderful. We can't do it without you. And um, I, I would just like to say a very big thank you to Councillor Pauline Townsend and Councillor Belinda Hassan, who've um, joined us this evening as well. So thanks so much. <laughs>